It's good to be with the church. My name is Halim Sa. I serve as one of the pastors and elders here at The Stone. Two weeks ago, we started our series in the book of 1 Peter. And as we talked about before, Peter is addressing a group of suffering Christians. Peter is addressing a group of Christians who are suffering. Not only are they going through the suffering and the pain and the trials of everyday life that comes to anyone and everyone, but they are going through specific suffering. They're going through specific persecutions that come to those who follow Jesus. There's a suffering and a persecution that will come to those who follow Jesus, and Peter is addressing those things. Jesus said in John 15, verse 20, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus said, if, they, if the world persecuted me, all those who follow me are also going to be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12 tells us, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So if you desire to live a godly life, if you desire to follow Jesus in this world, you will be persecuted. You're not going to receive health and wealth. You're going to receive persecution and suffering. That's what the Bible says. And Peter says later in chapter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. He's saying as Christians, when suffering comes our way, when persecution comes our way, simply because we are following Jesus in this world, we should not think, oh, this is strange. We should expect it because the Bible said so, because Jesus promised it. But the persecution we face Today in America, as Christians, compared to our brothers and sisters in Christ across the world, it may seem small, right? I've personally only felt it slightly and on a very few occasions, like when I was at a, an abortion clinic, and with other believers, we were praying for the lives of the unborn while people were screaming and yelling profanities against us. Or... I'm in the neighborhood and I'm getting to know my neighbors and as soon as I tell them I'm a pastor, they start treating me differently. But just slightly, right? Just slight things here and there. Only times in my life I felt even closest to being physically in danger were all outside of the U.S. When Matt and I were detained at an airport being questioned for a couple of hours because security just found out we were there helping and serving the hated minority group of that country. Or one time when I suddenly found myself surrounded by a group of about 100 Muslim men because they just found out I was a missionary in that country. Everything is okay. Most of them were very friendly, very hospitable. But in that moment, initially, nervous, scared. All that to say, what I faced is nothing. And most of us, not all of us, most of us living in America today we aren't facing the bulk of the types of persecution that Peter is addressing, but, but we may one day. We may one day. And one of the incredible things about God's word is this, that oftentimes it equips us and it prepares us for the things that we are currently going through, but it does more than that. It equips us and prepares us for the things that we perhaps might go through. It equips us and prepares us for the things that we perhaps will go through in the future. And this is how Peter is going to equip us, by telling us that as God's people living in this world, as God's people following Jesus in this world, we will suffer. The suffering might be great, it might be small, but you will suffer, you will be persecuted. But because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, you will never ever, even for one second of your life, go through that suffering, go through that persecution without hope. That's what he's saying. As Christians, you will suffer, but you will never suffer without hope. And that hope that God gives us is what will enable us to persevere and not only that, but flourish through the suffering, that we come out on the other side of the suffering more beautiful, that we come out on the other side of being persecuted more faithful, more obedient to Jesus. And that's what we're going to see today. Let's look at the text. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So we see that Peter says we have a hope, but he doesn't just call it a hope, he calls it a living hope. Why is it a living hope? For three reasons. Because our hope is anchored in the past. It's anchored in the past, and our hope is secured for the future. It's anchored in the past, it's secured for the future, and it's a hope that is presently experienced. Presently experienced, anchored in the past, secured for the future, presently experienced. Why is the Christian hope a living hope that gets us through any hardship, persecution, or trial? Because first of all, it's anchored in the past. Let's read verse three again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are born again to a living hope through what? through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And the question is, when did the resurrection of Jesus Christ happen? When did the thing happen that, because of it, we have been born again? When did it happen? It happened before any of us were alive, before we had anything to do with it. It happened 2,000 years ago. God accomplished our salvation through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The Bible says in the past. As we talked about last week, he planned it before the foundations of the world, and 2,000 years ago, it was accomplished. Before you were born, before you had anything to contribute. Jonathan Edwards once said that you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. It's a humbling statement, right? You contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. What Peter is saying is that your salvation, you did nothing to produce it, you did nothing to earn it, you did nothing to accomplish it, therefore you can hope. Therefore you can hope, right? Peter is saying that the hope of your salvation is not based upon your work, it's based upon God's work. It's not based upon your faithfulness, it's based upon God's faithfulness. It's not on the basis of you coming to him, but it's built on the basis of him coming down to you. He did it. He accomplished it. What Peter is saying is that if any of us were going to be saved, it required something greater than anything we could produce or accomplish. Let's look at the text again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Notice what it says. He has caused us to be born again. It doesn't say he invited us to be born again to a living hope, right? It doesn't say he gave us the opportunity to be born again. It doesn't say he gave us the chance to say the sinner's prayer to be born again. It says he has caused us to be born again. What the Bible is saying is that the cross of Jesus didn't make men save a bull, but that it actually saved. What do you believe about the cross of Jesus? That it made you savable as long as you responded rightly? Or that the cross of Jesus actually saved? What Peter is saying is that God didn't just give us the opportunity to be saved as long as we would respond properly, but that the resurrection of Jesus actually saved us, that we are not saved by our proper response to the news of the resurrection, but that we are saved by the fact of the resurrection. Not our response to the news of the resurrection, but the fact of the resurrection that in fact, at the resurrection of Jesus, we, that's where salvation actually happened. God didn't leave our salvation to chance. That's what this is saying. He didn't leave it to chance. 
He accomplished it fully. He did it. When it comes to our salvation, we're not the actors, we're the acted upon. Well, someone might say, that sounds like election again to me. Well, it is, it is. As we talked about last week, the doctrine of election is what gives us great hope in the midst of the trials and the persecution. Without the doctrine of election, Peter is saying you won't make it through the suffering and the trial. You might be saying, well, God saved me because I believed. You see, I did do something. God saved me because I believed. But if I were to ask you, why did you believe, and for instance, not your neighbor, what would you say? You might say, well, because I was willing to listen and not my neighbor. Well, why were you willing to listen and not your neighbor? You might say, well, because I was less resistant. Well, why were you less resistant? Well, because I was seeking the truth more than my neighbor. Well, why were you seeking truth more than your neighbor? You see, if we keep digging, if we keep asking why you believed and not your neighbor, you will come to one of two conclusions. One of two conclusions. Either you will keep pointing to yourself, you will keep saying because there was something about me, because I was more open, because I was more willing, because I was less resistant, or hopefully you'll come to the biblical conclusion that Peter points to, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us a caused us to be born again to a living hope. Why did he cause us to be born again to a living hope? Peter says, according to his great mercy, not according to our great openness, not according to our great willingness, not according to our great intelligence to figure it all out, but according to his great mercy, and that's it that there's only one reason for why God saved you, because he was merciful, because of his great mercy. And any attempt that are trying to credit ourselves or explain our salvation to something that we are or something that we did, right, is an attempt that takes away from the greatness of God's mercy. And at the heart of it, that's what election is all about. At the heart of it, that's what the doctrine of election is all about, that it's the mercy of God and it's the mercy of God alone that is the ground for why you are a Christian today. Why are you a Christian? Keep digging. Keep digging. Why are you a Christian? Because of God's mercy. That's it. Okay, but some may ask, if we're saved by God's mercy alone, then why doesn't he just show his mercy to everyone and save everyone, right? When some hear about the doctrine of election, this is the greatest problem we might have. What about all the people that God doesn't elect, all the people that God isn't merciful towards? I was reading a Tim, Tim Keller sermon on this text and he explained it a lot better than I ever could. He says that that kind of response, in a way, is the right response. It's the right response, why? Because if you look at the Bible, it tells us over and over and over again that God wants everybody to be saved, that he weeps over the one lost sheep, that he's willing to leave the 99, go after that one, and rejoice over that sheep, that he desires none to perish, right? So the question is, why doesn't he then just go get everybody? Why doesn't he show his mercy to everyone and save everyone? And do you know what the answer is? The answer is that when we get to his throne, and when we ask him that question and we get the answer, we're going to realize that his mercy, that his mercy is greater than anything we could have imagined. That his mercy is greater than anything we could have imagined. Those of you that struggle with the doctrine of election, do you know what your problem is, Keller asks? Do you know what your problem is? Your problem is that you think you can imagine a more merciful plan of salvation than God did. You think you can imagine a more merciful plan of salvation than God did, and that you can imagine that God could be more merciful than he already is. You think you can imagine a God who is more merciful, but that's impossible. Why doesn't he go get everybody if he wants everybody? If you don't believe in the doctrine of election, here's your reasoning, because it's clear in the Bible he doesn't save everybody, so why, right? If you don't believe in the doctrine of election, you're, you might say, because he doesn't want to violate our free will. 
right? That's your answer. Because he doesn't want to violate our free will. Well, that's really sweet of him, isn't it? I don't want to violate their free will, so I'll send all those people to hell just so they can keep their free will. Well, forget my free will. Insult my free will. Overwhelm my free will. Insult me for a moment and save me forever, right? That is not a more merciful God. Are you saying we don't have free will? No, I'm not saying that. Free will is a very real thing. But you know what the mark of a good father is? You know what the mark of a good father is? Is a good father who knows when to overwhelm the free will of his children. You know, I overwhelm the free will of my children all the time. Just about all the time. (laughs) Why? Parents, you know this. Why do you overwhelm the free will of your children? That's very unloving of you. Why do you do it? Because they're yours because you love them, and it's the mark of a good father, it's the mark of a good parent that overwhelms the free will of their children, especially if it will do them irreparable harm. And that's the great hope that we have, is that in in Jesus, we have a good father who didn't leave our eternity to chance. He didn't leave it to chance. He did everything that's needed for your salvation. He's already accomplished it in the most merciful way. And so come what may in the short 80 years of this life. That's what we're saying. Because he has accomplished my salvation, because I believe in him, because I'm saved, come what may in the short 80 years of our suffering, trial, or persecution, because we know that we're saved and we'll be with our King Jesus where there'll be no more pain, no more sorrow. And so we have this great hope that's anchored to the past, finished work of the cross. But not only that, we have a hope that is secured in the future. It's secured in the future. Let's read again. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Verse four tells us that we have a hope of a future inheritance that is secured for us. You know, when we're suffering, when we're being persecuted, it it, it seems so bad because it seems like everything that we cherish in this life is being taken from us, right? All the good things of this life is being taken from us, whether it be your health, your possessions, or it may be your reputation. You might be losing your friends, you might be losing your family members, or you might even lose your life. But Peter tells us that in the midst of everything in this life being taken away, we can still hope, why? Because there's something being kept. You're losing everything, but there's something being kept for you. It's being kept for you, an inheritance, he says. And what is it about this inheritance that ought to make us hope? Peter tells us three things about this inheritance. He says it's imperishable, imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. First of all, that it's imperishable. What does that mean? It means that it can't be attacked. It can't be attacked. You know, the Israelites were given an earthly inheritance in the Old Testament, remember? The land of Canaan. And the Bible tells us that at times, because of their sins, their land, their inheritance was ravaged. It was destroyed by invading armies. In other words, it was perishable. It could be attacked and destroyed by foreign forces. But Peter tells us that Our inheritance isn't earthly. It's not health and wealth in this world. Our inheritance, it's heavenly. It's imperishable. It's beyond the reach of foreign forces. It's kept in heaven for you. You know, sometimes you may dream of getting a letter in the mail, and the letter says, you know, you're the sole living heir of a billion-dollar estate, you know, and that would be great. But you and I both know that in this world, it's not safe. In this world, it's not safe. No matter the size or the greatness of the inheritance, if it's an earthly inheritance, it can all be taken away through suffering or pain, right? Through the market crashing, through theft, or through sickness, you could, you could, could be kept from enjoying your great inheritance. The point is, it's perishable. But you, Christian, you have an inheritance that's heavenly. 
It's imperishable. Peter also tells us that in our inheritance is undefiled. What does that mean? He tells us that it can never spoil. That's what it means. It can never spoil. Jeremiah speaks of the earthly inheritance that the Israelites received, and he says that they have defiled it through their idolatry and sins. Jeremiah 2, 7. I brought you into the fruitful land to eat its fruit and its good things, but you came and defiled my land and my inheritance. You made an abomination. The Israelites defiled their inheritance with their sins. And so the natural question is, could our inheritance be defiled in any measure there by our sins here? And Peter says no. Our inheritance is undefiled. It won't spoil. It can't spoil. Even when we find ourselves sinning, when the suffering gets so bad, and when we find ourselves complaining and doubting and not trusting, can our inheritance be taken away? No. Our inheritance will remain undefiled, undiminished, unspoiled. Why? Why? Because, as we talked about, it's solely based upon God's great mercy. It's not based upon our great obedience. God's great mercy, not our great obedience. It's secured by the finished work of the cross and his resurrection from the dead. His righteousness, not our righteousness. His faithfulness, not our faithfulness. That's what the whole point of the Old Testament, the Israelites receiving the promised land, is all about. Right? As great as the inheritance is, could it be attacked? Could we lose it because of our sins and because of our failures? Yes, that's what the Old Testament is talking about. And so we needed a better inheritance. We needed a better inheritance that would be heavenly. We needed a better inheritance that could not be taken away even because of our sins because it's based, rooted in God's righteousness and not our own. And lastly, Peter says that our hope is secured in the future because we have an inheritance that is unfading, unfading. In other words, our inheritance won't be like everything else we get in this world. The things in this world, no matter how amazing and great it may be at first. What's the last thing that you got that you've been really wanting? You finally got it. It's amazing. It's great. But then what happens? eventually fades, eventually fades, right? It loses its luster. We grow tired of it even. But our heavenly inheritance is unfading. What Peter is saying is that even after our trillionth day there, we won't ever say, oh, there goes God's glory again. <laughs> there goes God's glory again. We won't ever grow tired of it. It is unfading. G.K. Chesterton, an English writer, poet, theologian, once wrote that perhaps... We grow tired of things because sin made us old. Sin didn't just cause us to die, but that it also made us old. While children never get tired of saying again and again that perhaps because of sin we get tired of even the greatest things of life because sin causes even the great things to fade. He said it might be true that the sun rises regularly because he never gets tired of rising. His routine might be due not to a lifelessness, but to a rush of life. The thing I mean can be seen, for instance, in children, because children have a bounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things to be re repeated unchanged. They always say, do it again, and the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. <laughs> for grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony, but perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. There's coming a day when we will experience our heavenly inheritance that is unfading. Because it's truly that great, and also because we'll once again be young. We'll once again be young. So why does this give us hope? 
Because when we suffer, when we're being persecuted, things that we cherish are being taken away. But at most, what can man take away? Well, they can take us. They could take our lives, right? They may take our lives. Insert Braveheart quote there. They may take our lives. But what happens when we die? We get our great salvation. We get our imperishable, undefiled, unfading inheritance. We get our glory. Most importantly, most importantly, we get God as our father forever. There's a Romanian pastor named Joseph Sog. He was regularly beaten, imprisoned, and threatened for preaching the gospel, but he just kept preaching the gospel. And the communist government, they they just had it with this guy. They brought him in, they beat him to a pulp, and they said to him, if you preach the gospel one more time, one more time, we will kill you. And you know what this pastor said? He looked at him and he smiled, and he said, first of all, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you because, because you beat me, you gave me the gift of suffering, and you allowed me to taste the sufferings of Jesus. You gave me a taste of what it was like for my Jesus to suffer for me, and so thank you. And second, if you kill me, I get to be with Jesus, right? I get glory. And he says, you can't threaten me with glory. As Christians, you can't threaten us with glory, he's saying. What is he saying? He's saying he has a living hope. And that living hope disarms the greatest, greatest weapon that the world could hold against you. And then he told them, in fact, if you kill me, there's lots of tapes out there, lots of audio cassette tapes out there of me preaching the gospel and lots of tapes that people used to ignore. But now, if you kill me, they're going to go listen because they're going to say, this man died for this message. I must give it a listen. And so by you killing me, you will grow God's church. And you know what they did? He said they let him go and never bothered him again. <laughs> That is the power of living hope. What's the most they can do? Well, they can kill us, but even if they kill us, we get to be with Jesus. We get glory, and as Christians, you can never threaten us with glory. Lastly, we have a living hope, because our hope, though it is anchored in the past and secured in the future, it's to be experienced in the present. It's to be experienced in the present. What good is the past? What good is the future if I'm suffering right now, right? If, you, if you've ever suffered at that kind of level, right? The past, who cares? The future, who cares? I'm suffering right now. What good is our future inheritance if honestly, I just don't know if I'm gonna make it. What if the suffering and the persecution, it gets so bad that I just bail on Jesus? Like Judas, betray him or walk away from him forever. What if I just don't make it? How many of you feel that? I know I do. A couple of weeks ago, Angela and I watched a movie called Silence, and it was about the persecuted Japanese Christians. And these early Japanese Christians, they were tormented in such horrific ways, but the Japanese rulers that were tormenting them always gave them a way out. They always gave them a quick way out to end the suffering, to end the pain, to end the imprisonment. What they would do is they would put an, an image of Jesus on the ground and all these Christians had to do was just put their foot on him. They were asked, even in the lightest way, just step on him and then they'll be let go. They can be free and live with their families what if the persecution gets so bad? What if the suffering lasts for so long? Or what if the temptation of this life becomes so great that we just, just step on it? All the pain, it'll end. You can go live free, be with your family. 30 pieces of silver seems a lot better than death on a cross. What good is our future inheritance if we don't even make it there? What can it avail us that our salvation is secured in a quiet harbor when we are driven to and fro amidst the thousand shipwrecks? This is what Peter says, verse four. 
to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So he's saying, we have a future inheritance that is kept for us, kept in heaven for you. But then look at verse five. Who, that's us, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter says, not only is there an inheritance being kept for us, but we are being kept for it. That's what he's saying. He tells us that we are by God's power being guarded, being kept, what? Through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What Peter is promising us is that no matter what the suffering, God's children will always make it. Church, I don't know what you're going through. And some of you, you're asking that question. I don't know if I'm gonna make it. And what Peter is saying, what God is promising you is that you will make it. You're gonna make it. You're being guarded. There is a future inheritance being kept for you, but not just that. You are being kept for it. How do you know, Peter? How do you know I'm gonna make it? Because you're being guarded by God's power. That's what Peter says. He says you're gonna make it not by your power, but by God's power, and what is God's power doing? God's power is guarding you, he says, keeping you. It's military language, it means shielded. It means kept under guard. It's used of protective custody. God has put you under arrest, as it were, to keep you safe until the end. It actually means that you are locked up in a garrison. You are locked up in a garrison. And so when you're in a garrison, not only are you safe from attack, from outside forces, from foreign force forces, but you are also safe from escaping yourself. You are kept, you're safe from outside attack and safe from yourself. Safe from yourself. Don't you know that if you could lose your salvation, you would? Don't you know this about yourself? That if you could walk away from Jesus, you would have already but we're being guarded by God's power. You're being kept. Peter said, by God's power, we're being guarded through faith. Not kicking and screaming, but through faith. Faith is the tangible evidence we are given in this life for assurance that you belong to him, for assurance that he is your father and you are his child. How do you know if you're elect? If you're asking Peter, Peter, you talk about this election thing, how do I know if I'm elect? How do I know if I'm saved? If you ask Peter this question, he would ask you this. Well, do you have faith? Well, do you believe? As he would say later in verse eight, though you have not seen him, do you love him? Church, as you sit here right now, none of us, not one of us, we've seen, none of us have seen Jesus with our eyes, right? None of us have seen Jesus with our eyes. Yet do you love him? Yet do you love him? Peter said, though you do not see him now, do you believe in him? Do you rejoice in him? He's saying that's faith. That's not of yourself. That's faith. What's happening? God's keeping you. He's guarding you until that last day. That's how you know. Your faith right now as you sit is the living hope that you can experience right now in the present. It's not just a past thing. It's not just a future thing. It's a present thing. It's a living hope. It's alive right now, beating in your chest, causing you to believe, to have faith, to love, to trust, to rejoice, even though you've never seen it. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're going through some incredible suffering right now. And life, in a lot of ways, it would just be so much easier if you would just step on him. Just be done with him. But you can't, right? You still believe. You still have faith. It, it's as though you can't help but to believe, even if it's the faintest belief that says, I do believe, help my unbelief. And why is that? It's because you're being kept. It's because of God's power that is at work in you, guarding you, keeping you until that last day. And if you're here and if you've never believed, 
you're here and if you've never believed, believe in him today. It's as simple as that. Believe in him today. Though you've never seen him, love him. Though you do not see him now, believe in him and rejoice in him for his death on the cross for your sins and his resurrection from, your, from his death for your salvation. Believe in him. Knowing that it would be impossible for you to believe if God's power was not at work within you already. Do you sense his power at work within you? Believe in him. And so in conclusion, what do we do? What should be our response to this God who has given us such a living hope, anchored in his past, finished work, secured in the future, and is presently experienced as we are being kept, guarded by God's power? What should be our response to this God? Well, Peter already told us, didn't he? He said, blessed be. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has caused us to be born again to a living hope. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bless, we worship, we sing. You know, Christians are the only people that can sing through suffering. We're the only people, this is it. No other people, when they suffer, when they're persecuted, can sing. You and I are the only people, as God's people, who has a living hope that can sing through whatever persecution, whatever suffering, rejoice through whatever pain. This has always been the mark of God's people. Always been. And so let's do that now. Let's pray, and then let's sing. Let's bless him, worship him, for the living hope that he's given us in Christ Jesus. Father, what great hope is this? A living hope. Father, at a great cost to yourself, at the cost of your son, you have purchased it for us. And Lord, that is, there's an imperishable, undefiled, unfading inheritance waiting for us. God, you are our portion. You are our inheritance and you have guaranteed that we're gonna make it. No matter what this pain, no matter what the suffering, because of Jesus, because we are your people, because you are our good Father, we're going to be kept and guarded until the very end. And Father, in this we rejoice, in this we say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Oh Lord, we long for that day. Keep us and guard us until that day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.